Hi, this is Pastor Darrell Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Wednesday, November 11th, 2015. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's get right into it today. This first story comes out of Breitbart.com. It says, Obama becomes first sitting president to pose for cover of LGBT magazine. That's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender magazine. Obama, first president to pose for it. He made history by becoming the first ever sitting U.S. president to pose for the cover of an LGBT magazine. He's on the cover of Out Magazine's latest Out 100 issue as the publication's Ally of the Year. Remember a couple of years ago, Time Magazine had a cover of Obama with a rainbow saying, First Gay President. The 44th President of the United States is our Ally of the Year, a president who came to office on a wave of euphoria appeared to lose momentum halfway through and has since rallied, helping us secure marriage equality, among other landmark initiatives that are transforming our place in America, the editors of Out wrote in an article accompanying the cover. We all have seen his promotion of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people. And I'm for all men are created equal but I'm not for going against God's word to make things appear in a way that they shouldn't appear. You know, there's a reason why Jesus told us in Luke that as in the days of Noah, so would it be at the coming of the Son of Man. In Noah's day, the world was wicked, so wicked, so evil, that God destroyed it completely, except for Noah and the ones in the ark. Jesus said, as in the days of Lot, in the days of Lot, who lived in Sodom, there was such evil perversion in those twin cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, that God destroyed them completely. Here we are today with a president saying we're no longer a Christian nation, forcing all states to recognize gay marriage forcing everyone to participate in abortion through Obamacare, thumbing his nose at God. There's a reason the Bible tells us at the times of the end that people would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, lovers of themselves. And here we see the world saying, oh, you know, whatever wicked perversion you like, it's okay, because we're all created equal, and you can have whatever wicked, evil perversion you like. It's really kind of sad, but God's Word told us these things would happen. Out of Prophecy News Watch, Sign of the Times, Church Promotes Transgender God. I don't make these things up, people. The story says, just when it seems things could not get any crazier, a church that is part of a major denomination is claiming that God has followed the lead of Bruce Jenner and is now a transgender and has changed himself into a woman. Oh, what wicked blasphemy. What wrath will come upon this church? I'm sorry, people. When you go against the word of God, you go against God. This new revelation came from the First Church Somerville United Church of Christ, which recently issued a public service announcement informing the body of Christ that despite millennia of biblical teaching on the subject, God is a transgender who had sex change surgery and decided to become a woman. Blasphemy upon blasphemy. The Bible says if you add to the word, all the plagues contained therein will be added unto you. This church, oh God help them, says God is good all the time. That means God is a diva and girl, Jesus is fear, said Jones, the drag queen in residence, wrote on his website. What do drag queens or drag kings have to do with Jesus or the gospel, he asked. We at FCS believe God doesn't make no junk, 
So whether you're straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, or still playing hard to get, Jesus loves you and so do we. Amen, baby. So come and get yours at this here church. What kind of gospel are they preaching? Yes, God loves everyone, but sin is sin. How about we not glorify it? How about we not lift it up and thumb it in the, in the face of God and say, look, we're going to do this whether you like it or not. Just go ahead and forgive us. Sin is sin. There's a reason God called it an abomination when man lies with man as with woman. In Leviticus, what was that, 1811? Somewhere in there. Claiming God's transgender had a sex change. I'm sorry, that's just beyond blasphemy to me. That's horrible. And again, understand something. I'm not like some other religion that seeks to kill people who blaspheme my Savior, who blaspheme my God. I don't have to defend God. He'll defend himself. He will take care of those who blaspheme against him, who slander his name, who drag his holiness through the mud as if he's some kind of transgender pervert. Sorry, I, I call it what it is. It's a perversion. It's a sexual perversion. <sighs> Saying God is a transgender. There's a reason Jesus called him Father. God the Father. There's a reason. God is not a transgender. Now, I... Every reference to God in the Bible is of a male gender. Now, I'm not trying to put God in a box because no box can contain him. But Jesus referred to him as Father, and he... And for anyone to say otherwise goes against what my Bible says. How about this? Out of Christian Post. Christians protest transgender Jesus play. Gospel according to Jesus, Queen of Heaven. This is the world we live in, people. This is the wickedness upon the face of this planet. God destroyed the whole earth at one point with flood, with water. Bible's clear next time it'll be with fire. You know, fire is more of a cleansing agent than water is. Water might wash things, but fire purifies things. This, this play, The Gospel According to Jesus, Queen of Heaven, being produced in uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. <sighs> Recreates biblical stories with a different slant. The play imagines a transgender Jesus coming back to the world today. Yeah, I'm sorry, people. You're missing the mark of what the gospel is if this is the kind of garbage you follow after. This is the world we live in. When the disciples asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your return? What will be the sign of the end of the world? In Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, the first thing Jesus said in all three of those passages is, watch that no one deceives you. Here's some more deception for you. Calling God a transgender. How many people are going to follow after this false doctrine? Saying, oh, that sounds good to me. All the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people going, hey, yeah, that sounds really good. Maybe you've not heard of this, but there's a Queen James Version Bible out there that removes the fact that homosexuality is a sin. So... Now it's apparently okay in all 50 states in America for a man to marry a man and woman to marry a woman. Out of JewsNews.com, university academics say pedophilia is natural and normal for males to be aroused by children. I told people years ago that, oh, if the gay thing is passed, what's next? Pedophiles bestiality, people marrying children, people marrying animals, people marrying sex toys or 
objects. This story talks about the classification of sexuality in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM. This conference, which was titled Classifying Sex, Debating DSM-5, had a number of speakers who spoke in favor of sex with children, which is supporting pedophilia. The American Psychiatric Association, which produced it, had been in this battle over whether hebophilia should be included as a disorder. Hebophilia is the sexual preference for children in early puberty, typically 11 to 14 year olds. And everyone at this conference was in favor of sex with children. You watch, this will be one of the next things they try to get past. Oh, it's okay for a man to marry a eight-year-old boy. Or a nine-year-old girl. See, there's, there's something wicked here. That's a perversion. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. <sighs> Sign of the times, people. Sign of the times. Every man, woman, and child will answer to God for their actions, for their sins. We will be held accountable. Moving on. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Bennett says Prime Minister's comments on possible unilateral withdrawal from the West Bank is dangerous. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is sending a dangerous message by saying Israel may leave some land unilaterally, Education Minister Naftali Bennett said. If terrorism pays, terrorism will increase, Bennett said. Unilaterally, giving land to Arabs is always a grave mistake. Talking about it at the height of a wave of terrorism sends the opposite message of what we need to send. The enemy needs to be punished for terrorism, not be given a prize for murdering Jews. Bennett added that the unilateral action Israel must take is to annex Jewish settlements in the West Bank. I think Jesus was pretty clear in Matthew 24, when he was talking about the times of the end, when he said things like in verse 16, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. There's going to be trouble in Judea. Oh, or as the world likes to refer to it, the West Bank. See, West Bank takes away any biblical reference to the land that God gave his chosen people. That's why the world likes to use that term. Huh. Interesting times we live in, people. Very interesting times. Watch that you be not deceived. If someone comes to you with any other gospel other than the one you learned about Jesus, may they be forever accursed, Paul said in Galatians. If anyone comes to you with anything that goes against God's word, they're deceiving you. They're bringing a false doctrine, a false gospel, they're false teachers. If they're telling you God's a transgender like Bruce Jenner, sorry, epic fail. They're going against the word. I'm going to go with God's word over man's lies every single time. Out of Israel Today, headline says, This is the end of the Palestinian people. Yesterday, two Palestinian boys, 11 and 13 years old, stabbed and tried to kill a 37-year-old Israeli man at the train station. People were cheering. What kind of society cheers when an 11-year-old stabs someone? How can you comprehend Palestinians who allow or even send their children to kill Jews? Of course, this is nothing new. Palestinians have been doing this for decades, sending suicide bombers, women with knives, uh, crashing cars, tractors into in innocent bystanders, calling them martyrs and heroes. This incitement to jihad, this martyrdom and the glorification of Jew killers, applauding parents who encourage their sons to kill Jews. The press jumping to illustrate blood-filled scenes, including child warriors, children carrying guns, photos of fighters launching rockets aimed at Israeli civilians and children, quite well known. The Palestinians are the only group of people known to mankind that allows themselves to find honor in their children killing innocent people. No other culture teaches their children to sacrifice themselves in order to take vengeance on innocent people. Ah. 
you know, we, we haven't heard from any Palestinian parents telling their children it's wrong to attack Jews. You don't hear of teachers in Palestinian schools teaching children it's wrong to run around stabbing Jews in the streets. If anyone's concerned for the Palestinians, they should demand action now with an end to this wickedness, an end to this killing, this hatred. Civilizations crumbling all around us. We can't afford to confront this devious justification of murder propagated by the Palestinians against the Jews. The children of Palestine, the Palestinian children, this will be the end of them. I mean, if they can't find a way to keep their own kids from sacrificing themselves in order to kill Jews, then they're doomed. They've rejected the basic principles of the sanctity of life, principles necessary to secure or civilized human society. And if this downfall is not confronted, resisted, and stopped immediately, it's going to result in the complete degradation and the ruin of what is now known as the Palestinian people. How about this out of freebeacon.com? United States to help Iran build nuclear reactor. United States is going to help Iran build a nuclear reactor. Yet they turned Israel down for an increase in the money they need. $150 billion for Iran, but only $3 billion a year for Israel. Wow. So it would take 50 years for Israel to get what Iran got in one deal. Hmm. Who's Obama really supporting? Pretty clear, isn't it? $150 billion to Iran, a rogue terrorist Muslim nation? $3 billion a year to Israel. A democratic society that allows the worship of all faiths. Hmm. Yeah, Mr. Obama, your fruit is showing and it's rotten to the core. The United States and other global powers are helping Iran update and reconstruct a nuclear reactor that has been suspected of helping the Islamic Republic produce enough material for a potential nuclear weapon. Really? The madness continues. They turn their itching ears away from the truth and believe myths and fables. It's just amazing to me how anyone could think this is the right thing to do. Oh, here's a society, a nation that calls for the complete destruction of Israel. Let's let them have nukes. Let's give them $150 billion to support terrorism. Hmm. You know, when Jesus told us there would be earthquakes in diverse places, Matthew 24, how about this headline out of enidnews.com from Enid, Oklahoma? Headline says, Oklahoma, world's number one earthquake area. Let me just say, you don't get much more diverse than Oklahoma. And I don't speak disparagingly against Oklahoma. I was born there. I grew up in Oklahoma. I went to the University of Oklahoma. I'm an Okie. <laughs> My parents are both Texans. They were transplanted to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where I was born in an army hospital. I grew up on a farm in southwest Oklahoma. Sooner born, sooner bred. When I die, I'll be sooner dead. I love Oklahoma. More earthquakes than anywhere else in the world in the past year. Wow. There's a place in the Wichita Mountains called Mears. Mears, Oklahoma. If you go in there, there's a great little restaurant there. They make a burger that's about as big as the plate. Huge Mears burger. If you're ever there, I highly recommend it. Inside this little restaurant slash store slash post office, there's a seismograph actively moving. And you can watch it as the dial is turning. When there's any movement, you see the needle moving around. There's been a few times I've been in there and you see the needle actually start doing this. It's pretty cool. They've had more earthquakes than anybody in the past year. Anybody in the world. That's amazing. That's pretty diverse. Let's get into the word. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. This says, um, 
Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. I heard a story recently about a, a dad and, and his son walking along the beach after this really strong storm came through. The storm was so strong that these waves were crashing on the beach and the wind blew and hundreds and hundreds of starfish were washed ashore and left so far from the water that they needed in order to survive. And as they're walking, this father and son, they they began a rescue mission. They started picking up these starfish one by one and just tossing them back into the ocean. And when the boy saw the hundreds and hundreds of starfish remaining, he became very discouraged. He said, Dad, there's too many. We can't save them all. We, we can't really make a difference here. The dad looked at the starfish in his hand that would have never made it back to the ocean on its own. He said, Son, we're making a difference to this one as he tossed it back in the water. You see, you and I can make a difference. Even if it's only one at a time. We know there's millions, if not billions of people who will reject the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean we can't make a difference. Because if you spend 20 years preaching the good news of the gospel and only one comes to the saving grace of Jesus Christ, it was worth it. It was worth it. God has called each and every one of us into service. Not just the pastors and the preachers and the missionaries. He's called us all to encourage others, to lift each other up as the day of the Lord approaches, to admonish one another, to strengthen one another, to sharpen each other, as iron sharpens iron, the Bible says, to bless each other. We can make a difference for the kingdom. Don't have a defeated attitude before you get started, because we are victorious already through Christ Jesus. Walk in that victory and understand it. In Romans 8, Verse 38 and 39 says, For I am persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Psalm 25, Psalm 25 starting in verse 11. It says, For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Look upon my afflictions and my pain, and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for there are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. O oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel, O oh God out of all his troubles. You ever feel like the problems in your life were like a line of dominoes? You know, one falls and it just sets off this chain reaction of trouble after trouble after trouble. You ever have this? Things going from bad to worse quickly. David knew what that was like. He had enemies surrounding him. They were waiting for his fall. They were trying to kill him. David felt pressure from all sides. He thought there was no way out. But he knew there was one he could always turn to in times of need. One he could always trust. He turned to God. He ran back to God. He confessed his sins. He asked for forgiveness. He pleaded for mercy. You know, when we're separated from God because of the sin in our lives, we have to repent and ask for forgiveness. 
So then with a clean heart, we can come back before God, boldly before the throne, and ask for his help. He'll hear us and he'll answer us for the honor of his name. <clears throat> Let's go to Genesis. Genesis 2, verse 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. <laughs> I can't help but imagine when Adam woke up from his sleep that God had put him under and he saw Eve standing there in her naked glory. I picture him going, Whoa, man! Hey, that's a good name. That's what I'll call her. Woman. Yeah. <laughs> you know Eve had to be just completely stunning and beautiful. Of course, because God created her. Marriage is not some human idea that someone came up with one day. God ordained man. God ordained man and woman to join together in complete union of body and spirit. The Bible teaches that man and woman were made for each other right from the beginning from God Almighty. You know, God's ideal of marriage is one man, one woman, together for life, till death do you part. Anything else is a perversion and an alteration of God's divine plan for marriage. God didn't plan for man to marry man, or woman to marry woman, or man to marry child, or beast, or object. But no matter how clear this speaks in Scripture on this issue, the world continually tries to change and amend the concept of marriage to accommodate the world's perversions, the latest trends, the, the culture of our time and ideas, perverting the gospel of marriage. Human beings have a strong need for companionship. God knew this from the beginning. In fact, God put that desire and that need in us. In fact, you realize the first commandment in the Bible, right? Um, let's see. Basically telling Adam and Eve to go have intercourse. Um, where is it? When he said, oh, and uh, Genesis 1, verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. First commandment given to man. Man and woman were designed to share their lives together, to share their love together, their trust. Marriage is at best is a, a companionship on so many levels. It's a spiritual companionship where, where the partners grow together, they support each other. <clears throat> Marriage is also a, a psychological union where each partner knows the other, loves the other, strengthens the other. Marriage is also a physical companionship for the pleasure and the enjoyment of each other. It's interesting in Genesis, God pronounced each day of his creation as good. The only part that was not good was the aloneness of man. Marriage is God's idea and God's plan to fill that emptiness. So don't let anyone else tell you what marriage should be. God already defined it. Who is man to redefine it? If you want to know what marriage is all about, get into the Word of God because it's clearly spoken of. It's very clear. In Matthew 19, verse 5, says, And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. The two will be one. One flesh. What does it mean for a man and woman to become one flesh? This, I believe, is speaking of the act of intercourse between a man and a woman that produces this one flesh relationship. Now, whether or not the man and woman ever cleave to each other in marriage, this physical act still binds them together as one flesh. That's the reason why sexual intercourse outside of a marriage 
whether it's extramarital or premarital, is, is very damaging. You see, whether or not people get caught or, or pregnant or hurt anyone else with their sin, they're doing a lot of damage to themselves. This is a relationship that, that takes place through this, this sexual act that makes us one with another person. There's no such thing as you know, a one-night stand or a night on the town. That's all there is to it. You know, there's so many things like alcoholism and, and child abuse and, and, and hatred and loss of love and hundreds of other things that are clearly wrong, but they're not grounds for divorce like adultery is. That tells me there's something very powerful in this act that takes place in this physical act and explains why Satan has exploited this area for so long. I mean, you, you can't see an ad driving down the road that's not sexual in nature. You can't watch TV for 20 minutes without seeing ads that are sexual in nature. Becoming one flesh with someone through sexual intercourse is not marriage. Okay? Marriage is, includes, but is even beyond becoming just one flesh. Jesus clearly pointed this out in John 4, verses 17 through 18, when he said that woman that was speaking to him at, jo at Jacob's well had uh, five prior husbands and the man she was currently living with was not her husband. I think it's pretty certain this woman was having sexual relations with the man she was living with, but that did not make him her husband. Marriage involves more than sexual relations. It's a covenant or a commitment between a man and a woman that corresponds to cleaving to each other that Jesus speaks of. For life, one man, one woman, for life. That's the way God designed it. That's the way God intended it. That's the way God made it. Any deviation from that is a perversion. Period. Whether you believe the Bible or not, whether you know God or not, Deviating from God's plan of marriage is perverting what God intended. So look around at all the perverts that are crying for another way. And yes, I'm sorry, but if you're perverting the Word of God, I'm going to call it what it is. Um, let's go to Romans 12, verse 10. I'm probably going to catch a little flack from some of those comments, but that's okay. I'm used to it. Romans 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. How many true friends do you have? Real, genuine, true friends. You know, you might come up with a bunch of names at once. Um, according to Facebook, I've reached my limit of 5,000 friends. But the more you look closely at the people you call your friends, how many of them are true friends? How many of them will stand by you no matter what? I think the reality is that most people don't have a whole lot of real, true, genuine friends. The ones who are loyal. The ones who will stand by you. The ones who will support you through thick and thin. It's funny because I think I have some greater friends online that I've never met face to face than some of my more casual friends that I've known for decades. That dependable, intimate closeness, that bond, I think that's what God wants for us. It's, it's a rare thing, though. It's hard to find. Yeah, David and Jonathan in the scripture, I think we can learn a lot from the relationship they had in, in 1 Samuel 18 or so. Um... They had a real friendship built upon the foundation of mutual respect, of love, an authentic, genuine commitment to each other. I think for true friendship, each party needs to appreciate 
the other's godly qualities. Now, granted, there's a lot of people that don't know God, but I think this starts with an attitude of valuing all people, not just the ones that know God. I mean, Jesus chose to die in their place even before they acknowledged him as Savior. So I think that means they have great worth to God, so they should have great worth to us. All life is valuable. All people are to be loved. Jesus said, love others as you love yourself. At the same time, this regard that David and Jonathan had toward each other was greater than just respect. It, it was like this, this admiration for qualities that, that Scripture commands. Loyalty to the nation of Israel, courage and strength in battle, and a strong faith in God. So, with that in mind, think again who your true friends are, your close friends, your best friends. My closest friend doesn't even know God. We've had this conversation for some 35 years. If that's the case with you, does your friend admire your biblical characteristics that they see in you, your godly qualities? Because I think that's one of the things that draws my closest friend to me, is he sees Christ in me. And I'm still working on him. It's like my lifelong mission, a great challenge that God has laid right before me. My best friend doesn't know the Lord. And I've been trying for years. In Hebrews 9.20, it says, Saying, This is the blood of the testament, which God hath enjoined unto you. There's a strange power about the, the blood. The sight has an effect on people. The Word of God in Leviticus. What am I looking for? Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Isn't that interesting? That was spoken in Leviticus. And then Christ on the altar with his blood made atonement for our souls. <sighs> blood. One of those things. Blood is a consecrated thing. It's murder to shed blood in anger. It's, I think, a dreadful crime to squander it in war. Blood, the life-giving blood. You know, when we contemplate the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, if you've ever seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, beautifully done, it gives you a more vivid description of what Christ went through prior to going to the cross. The blood, which is always precious and life-giving, is priceless when it comes from our Savior's side. The blood of Jesus seals the covenant of grace that God has with us and confirms it forever, for all eternity. You know, covenants of old were made by sacrifice. There is no shedding of blood without, uh, there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood, the Bible says. Our everlasting covenant was ratified in the very same way. Blood ensures the covenant that God made with us. The blood of Jesus made his testament valid. You know, if you think about it, a person's will has no power unless the testator dies, right? This soldier thrust his spear through the side of Jesus, proved that Christ was really dead. The soldier said, yes, he's dead. A trained soldier who knew what death looked like 
Some people said, oh, Jesus didn't die. He fainted from loss of blood. It just came to in the grave. No, nope. he died. He died on the cross for our sins. There's no doubt Christ died. And we can boldly appreciate what Jesus did on the cross, the legacy, the covenant that he left for his people. A dying Savior. This blood speaks to us, though. It doesn't tell us to sanctify ourselves in any way by our works, by our deeds. It doesn't call us to the newness of life and then incite us to completely consecrate the blood of the Lamb. This power of the blood must be known. It must be felt in your heart, in your soul, in your life, in your walk, in your work, in your witness, in your testimony. The blood of the Lamb that cleanses us of all sins, of all unrighteousness, of all wickedness, of all perversions. The blood of the Lamb. Without this blood, we can never be saved. Because it is the blood that makes an atonement for your soul, like Leviticus 17 verse 11 says. And as horrible as the death of Christ was on the cross, it had to happen. The disciples thought it was the end of their world. They thought, this can't happen. This is going to be the end of it all. But we know it was just the beginning. In the same way, we're going to see things happen in our lives that we're going to think are horrible. They shouldn't happen, and we'll do everything we can to fight against them. But many things like that have to happen because it's God's plan, it's God's will, it's God's way. And we need to trust Him no matter what. Do you trust Him? Have you given your life to God? Have you accepted the atonement that can only come through the blood of Jesus Christ? I hope and pray you do. I love you guys. God bless you. And good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.